Luke chapter number 23, beginning at verse number 50. Again, for those of y'all that aren't used to it, I'll tell you right now, there's a possibility I'm going to holler today. All right, go ahead, holler. Because the way I feel right now, I feel like I'm about to explode. All right, all right. Let them use you. Now, there was, I'm reading from the NIV, there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and an upright man. Who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea. And he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down. Wrapped it in linen cloth. And placed it in a tomb cut in the rock. One in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. On your way down, if you don't mind, helping me to bring emphasis to my message this morning. Look at somebody and tell them these words. Say, neighbor. Neighbor. Say, oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Good things. Good things. Can come out of a cave. Can come out of a cave. <laughs> Preach. Good things. Come out of a cave. My God. Good things. Good things. Can come out of a cave. A cave. Ladies and gentlemen, most holidays I have tried to deliver a unique perspective about the holiday itself. Most of you know if you've been in Kingdom Life for any period of time, I don't necessarily at Christmas time preach a traditional Christmas message. I remember one year I preached, his silence is significant. And I talked about how uh, in between, in between the two testaments was a period of about 400 years that there was no word from God. But yet, even though there was no word from God, it was just like in a play when you go into intermission. Just because it seems like nothing is going on, there were things happening behind the scene to set things up for the coming of the Savior. His silence was significant. <laughs> I remember one Christmas I preached from the subject, he loved me enough to choose me. Mm -hmm. Wasn't talking about anybody else, I was talking about the lowly shepherds. And you have to understand again, ladies and gentlemen, that the job of the shepherds, they were considered to be the lowest of the low of society. And yet when God decided to deliver the message that the newborn baby had been born, the first ones he came to weren't the kings, weren't the priests, it was to the low down shepherds that he sent the word to. And not only did he send the word to tell them that he was born, but he also gave them the invitation to go see the baby Jesus. Yeah. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, my assignment is to preach to you that good things can come out okay. of a cave. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Today, I feel something down in my belly because I've been saved for quite a while. I've given my life to Christ. I gave my life to Christ at eight years old. Mm. Now, I can't say I always lived right mm -hmm. since that time, but I gave my life to him at eight. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Come I remember on. saying, Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. Yes. I remember it. Uh -huh. The power of the Holy Ghost fell on me, and I spoke in other tongues at 12 years old. Nobody had to teach me. I just reached out and said, God, I believe that the Holy Ghost is real. And he touched me. Yeah. Amen. At 12 years old. Uh -huh. But ladies and gentlemen, this past Friday, we call it Good Friday. Mm -hmm. Can I take my time this morning? Yeah, take your time. This past Friday, I sat most of the day in services called Good Friday services, and specifically, they were seven last saying services, and they talked about the seven last sayings of Christ while he was on the cross. Mm. In fact, not only did I listen to them, I had the honor of preaching one of those sayings. Uh -huh. Good God. Mm. 
and when we think about it, and I, as I began to really sit there, now I have watched over the years, I've seen things like the Passion of the Christ, and I watched how they depicted Christ being brutalized and beat. I watched all of that, and I remember tears streaming down my face when that movie first came out because I thought about how Jesus really did pay a price just for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I know in this society today, we've become so accustomed to violence and so accustomed to, to just the, the, the uh, life and, and life having no meaning that to see something like that doesn't really matter to anybody anymore. But somehow in my heart, it bothered me that he went through everything he went through. And even though Mel Gibson depicted it the best way he could, he still did not measure up to the level of pain that he actually went through. Just for me. me. Forgive me if I make it personal. You can put your name in there if you want to, but I'm making it personal. He went through that just for me. So as I think about it, I've seen all of those. I've heard people preach about, about the cross. And I've shed many tears about the cross. But for some reason this year, Sitting in those seven last saying services, y'all, it stuck stronger with me. It, it, it resonated with me all over again. The power of the cross, the power of his death, it began to sit on me heavily. Yes. And I remember, God, I feel this thing today. Help me, Lord. I remember as he said, Father, mm -hmm. forgive them. Yes. For they know not what they do. I believe that as Jesus was on the cross, those seven last sayings represented something of a manifesto that he was delivering to the body of Christ. But he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was a message to each one of us that we've got to be careful that we learn how to forgive people no matter what they do to us. Sometimes you're going to be hurt. Sometimes you're going to be lied on. Sometimes you're going to be abused. Sometimes things are going to happen. People are going to do you wrong. They're not even realizing that they're being used by the enemy. But ladies and gentlemen, we still have to have the forgiveness of God in our heart and forgive them anyway. Yeah. Preach. Then, the second saying, he says, today, you will be with me in paradise. Uh -huh. I believe it speaks of the compassion of God that doesn't matter what you've done. Oh, this is a good shout right here. It doesn't matter what you've done. No matter what mistakes you made. Doesn't matter how you jacked yourself up and messed up your life. He still loves you enough and his grace is still sufficient that in spite of all of that, he still loves you enough to bring you in despite the fact that you were guilty. Is there anybody in here that was guilty? Yeah. Guilty. Let's be honest. I don't care how good of a person you are. You were guilty. Yes. Jesus. Get his compassion. So ladies and gentlemen, understand that we have to have compassion on other folks as well. Yeah. Mm. Then, he turns attention to his mother and the disciple. Y'all remember, don't you? Yeah. He said, woman, behold your son. And son, behold your mother. I believe that there were a couple of things that were happening here that I believe would speak to each one of us today. Ladies and gentlemen, there's too much talk about the crowd. Uh oh. Y'all not gonna help me this morning. Come on. I said there's too much talk about the crowd. Because if you look around, if you look around the cross and scan the landscape of the cross, there were a whole lot of enemies gathered around him who were looking at him in his place of shame. People who were a part of the crucifixion, and very few that were in his circle were still there. Yeah. My God. Good God Almighty. What do you do when everybody who said they're with you have abandoned you and walked away? God, what do you do when it looks like you are all by yourself? Now, you could focus on the crowd, focus on the people who have done you wrong, focus on the people around you that have hurt you, the people who are killing you, or you can take time to focus on what really matters. I want to tell somebody today stop focusing on the crowd and focus on your circle. Yeah. My God. Because at the base of the cross, the Bible describes that there were just a few people that were gathered around who were still with him. 
And he looks down and he says, woman, behold your son. And son, behold your mother. Jesus was dying. I'm just going to make this as brief as possible. He was dying. And as the eldest son of the house, he was responsible for the well-being of his mother. We don't have any recollection or any. Now, see, most people don't pay attention to this, but preachers, I want you to watch this. That Joseph was not mentioned much after the birth of Jesus. Matter of fact, if you want to look at the Bible, you'll find out that around age 12, when he was in the temple confounding the religious leaders, after that, that was particularly the last time that we see Joseph mentioned in the Bible. So we don't know where Joseph was. We don't know whether he was living or dead, but perhaps most likely historians say he was likely deceased, which is why now when Jesus dies, he says, my, my mama's got to be taken care of. So he looks down at the beloved disciple and says, disciple, here's your mother. He looks at the mother and says, mother, here is your son. And the Bible said from that day, he, she was taken care of in the disciple's house. Why is that significant? Because I believe he was saying something about family. Jesus. God cares about family. Family. I believe, we said it yesterday in prayer, I believe that when there are strong families, there can be strong churches. When there are strong families, there can be strong communities. When there are strong families, there can be a strong nation. Jesus. He talks about them, but let me hurry. And then after he says, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother, he then says now, he says, Lord, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm working my way up the hill, y'all. Just stick with me for a moment. Uh, he says, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever been in a place where you felt like God forsook you? And you notice in that particular text, ladies and gentlemen, in the book of Matthew, God never answered him back. Sometimes you are going to have experiences in your life. I'm trying to help somebody right here. You will have experiences in your life where you can do all of the formula. You can pray. You can fast. You can worship. You can do everything in the formula and God will still be silent. Jesus. Preach. Care how you try to manipulate it, he'll still be silent. And I come to submit to you today, ladies and gentlemen, it is imperative and important how you handle the silent moments. Do you give up because you're in a silent moment? Somebody talk to me up in here. No. Do you quit your assignment because God seems to stop talking? No. No. Do you throw in the towel just because it looks difficult and you're ready? And I mean, you you really, you don't know what's going to happen from here. Do you throw in the towel from here? No. Watch this. And I talked on Friday night about the irony of isolation because here he is saying, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, Eloi, Eloi. He was actually using the Jewish reference of Elohim, which means strong deliverer. How do you call him strong deliverer when you're in the middle of your hell, when everything is going wrong? How do you call him strong deliverer when things are breaking apart in your life? How do you call him strong deliverer? Jesus. Let me tell you what you got to do. Saints of God, you got to learn how to call him who he is, even when it doesn't look like what he said. Even when your current situation doesn't line up with what you think God is, you still got to keep calling him who he is. You may not have peace right now, but you got to get to a place where you still call him Jehovah Shalom. You may not have healing in your body right now, but you still got to be in a place where you call him Jehovah Rapha. Oh God, when you don't know which way to go, you still got to be able to call him your shepherd. I'm talking to somebody in here. When you need deliverance, you still got to be able to call him Elohim, the strong deliverer. Yeah. 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 Call him who he is. Oui. Even when it doesn't look like it. Because watch this. I heard my grandmama sing an old song. I said, my hope is built. Yeah. See, because if you can keep calling him who he is, even when you don't see it in your situation, you have hope that things are going to turn around. Yeah. Now, see, I'm on, I don't want to get stuck right there because I can preach that all over again. But look at somebody and tell them, you can have hope if you call him who he is. Yeah, I have hope. Mm. Oh, yeah. God have mercy. Now, 
Then after that, he said, I thirst. He had gone through so much. Blood had been lost. Fluids had been lost from his body. And yet, he says, I thirst. I believe that his thirst wasn't just a natural thirst, but it was a spiritual thirst because now everything had been drained out of him and had been depleted. He was gone, y'all. It was, it was, I mean, it was everything gone out of him. You read the scripture earlier, first lady. You read about the fact that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastised of our peace upon him with his stripes. We are healed. 39 stripes were on him. But do you not recognize that while he was marching to Calvary, carrying the cross, they were spitting on him? I believe that. Now watch it. They're spitting into open wounds. Catch me, y'all. I said he, they were spitting into open wounds. So now if they were carrying diseases, those diseases were introduced into the stripes. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah! Yeah, he was carrying Come on. our sins yes. and our sickness yeah. on his back. Yeah. I don't know who you are in here right now, but you might be carrying sickness, but I declare in the name of Jesus that you can grab a hold to the power of the stripes of Jesus. And today, somebody, whether you're watching my social media or you're sitting in this sanctuary, the power of the blood still works and he will heal your body. Yeah. Yes. 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 Finished. He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it, it is finished. It. What I came here to accomplish, it is finished. I come to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it was a sign to each one of us, you can't get stuck in the middle. Sometimes that's our problem. We start well, but we don't finish. Ah, we start well, but we won't go all the way through. Because most of the time, if we really knew what we had to go through to get to the end result of what God has for us, we would we, 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 we wouldn't we wouldn't start. Man, Amen. let's be honest. Uh -huh. If you knew you had to go through that divorce, mm -hmm. would you would you have accepted the assignment? No. Mm -hmm. no. If you knew that you were going to have to go through the abuse you went through, would you have accepted the assignment? If you knew you had to be lied on and become the scourge of the city, let me talk about myself. When you knew, if you knew you had to be the scourge of the city, people talking about you like a dog, calling you out because of your past, don't care about you, being nasty towards you, but then they smile in your face. Come on, am I talking to anybody? Yeah. If you knew you had to go through that, would you have signed up for this assignment? Most of us have to say, no, I would have signed up. Right. Preach. 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 But Jesus, in spite of it all, said, it is finished. finished. Let me hurry. And then lastly, he said, Father, into thy hand, I commend my spirit. Yeah. And the Bible said he gave up the ghost. Now, what makes me shout about that was that he, even though he was crucified by wicked men, they couldn't take his life. He laid it down. Mm. Yeah. And then not only did he lay it down, but he knew where to put it and yeah. put his trust. Like, sometimes you don't understand, ladies and gentlemen, you got to know where you got to put, where you trust, uh, who you can trust with, and understand that God is faithful. Mm. Do you understand that your God is faithful and that you can trust him with the most delicate parts of your life? Jesus said, I give my everything to you, Father. I surrender my spirit into your hands. I need to talk to somebody in here who's had some struggles giving everything over to God. Y'all could have sanctified, y'all give everything to God. But I've been in some positions sometimes that I have been, that I thought I could handle it better than he could. Have you ever been there? You thought you could handle it better than God. Yeah. Yeah. So you held on to it. You tried to work that thing the best way you knew how. Yeah. But I come to tell somebody this morning, the manifesto of Jesus is turn it over to the Lord. God, I hear the whole song ringing in my heart. They said, turn it over to the Lord and he will work it out. Somebody just shout, thank you, Lord, for working it out. Work it out. Work it out. Work it out. From that point, his spirit is committed to the Father, but his body was committed to a cave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> his spirit was committed to the Father, but his body was committed to the cave. It was Joseph, as we read in the text, of Arimathea, who went and asked for the body of Jesus. He said, I want to put him in my tomb. 
which was a cave. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, it was beautiful. Matter of fact, if you study history, where the cave was or where his tomb was, it was a garden. Mm -hmm. How do you handle what is beautiful on the outside? Mm -hmm. ah! yeah. But something ugly is going on on the inside. On the inside. Yeah. Ah, it was beautiful on the outside. See, that's how some of us are when we come to church. We look beautiful on the outside, but nobody really knows the pain that we are dealing with in our life. God, God, your cave might be a cave of isolation. You feel like you're by yourself. Your cave might be a, a cave of fear. You wonder whether you're going to live or die. There's stuff going on in your body that you're wondering, God, am I going to survive this day? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, somebody in here, even though you look good on the outside, you are dealing with a Hey. Oh, thank y'all for helping me preach. You might be dealing with a cave of unforgiveness, judgmentalism, low self-esteem. Whatever your cage is, let me just drop a nugget right here. You can't afford to judge anybody else for their cave. You don't understand what they're dealing with in their cave. Hey. Yeah. 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 Help me, Lord. Yeah. Preach, preach, preach. But ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you today. That many a great man encountered a cave. Yes. But not only did they encounter a cave, but pay attention because they encountered God's power. Yes. Yes. I said they encountered God's power yes. from a cave. Yes. Let me just give you a few as I round this corner. In Exodus, in Exodus, there was a man by the name of Moses who had to find God's power in. Okay, matter of fact, he made an arduous climb, a difficult climb early in the morning up to the top of the mountain. He climbed. See, there were no, there weren't necessarily pathways that they could just walk up easily. He had to climb that mountain, which meant he had to scar his hands, which means his feet got a little hurt. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, he had to climb against some rough stuff to get up there. What do you do when you think you're going higher, but you land in a cave? Moses was going higher, but he still landed in a cave. But I submit to you, you can find God's power in a cave. Because when he got there in the cave, the Bible declares that God passed by Moses. And when he passed by, Moses saw his hinder part. And by the time God got done working with Moses, when he came down from the mountain, Moses was all lit up. I come to tell you that by the time you come out of your cave, you will come out all lit up. People are going to wonder what happened to you. But it's because you had an encounter with God in a cave. Yeah. 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 Lord, I'm trying to behave. I really am. But it's Resurrection Sunday. And ladies and gentlemen, 1 Kings 19, there's another man by the name of Elijah, and he also encountered the power of God in a cave. How do you know, Lord? Because he had just got done fighting a mighty battle against Jezebel's prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the grove. And yet, in fighting the battle against all of them, depression landed him in a cave. A wrong sense of self-worth landed him in a cave. He ended up in a cave. Hey. But ladies and gentlemen, in him landing in a cave, one thing I can celebrate is the fact that despite that he was in a cave, it still didn't change. Watch this because God now comes through and we see a fire and an earthquake. Oh God, and we see a strong wind while he's in the cave. But the Bible declares that God wasn't in the fire. God wasn't in the wind. God wasn't in the earthquake. Similar things to what Moses experienced, but yet God wasn't in them this time. Don't think your experience with God has to be the same as somebody else's experience with God. Just know God knows how to deal with you. Because when God got done with the earthquake and with the fire and with the wind, the Bible after all of this, here came a still small boy. Yes. For some of you, God's going to move yes. by way of the earthquake, the wind, and the fire. Uh -huh. But then, by, for some of us, you're going to get your answer in the still small voice. Mm. I'm about to round this corner, y'all. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Oh, God. I'm so grateful to God. 
that he is God. Not only did Elijah experience God at the mountaintop, but ladies and gentlemen, we also find a man by the name of Gideon who had an experience in a cave. Oh Lord, Gideon was, he was considered, he was a weak man by men's standards. Are y'all with me today? Come on, come he was on. a weak man by men's standards, but he later became a mighty man of valor. Lord have mercy. He met God in a cave experience. He was there. Let me help you right here. Gideon was in a wine press, but he was in the wine press threshing wheat. You know fresh wheat in a wine press, but the reason why he was in a wine press threshing wheat up among the caves because the enemy kept coming in and stealing the little bit that they had. Is there anybody in here that part of your experience in your walk with God is that somehow the enemy kept coming in stealing stuff that you had kept creeping in and messing up things in your life, kept creeping in, trying to tear off stuff, trying to intimidate you, and so Gideon was in hiding because he was intimidated, he was afraid, and it was in that place in the cave that God sends an angel to speak to Gideon and tells him who he really is. Hallelujah. He tells him who he really is. God, they were hiding out in caves, and while you're still there hiding, God is speaking to somebody right now, saying, I'm not seeing you as a man in hiding. I'm not seeing you as a woman in hiding. But I come to declare to you today that you are a mighty man or mighty woman of valor. Look at your neighbor very quickly and say, neighbor, God is calling you mighty. I'm about to close this thing now, y'all. But the Bible said in 1 Samuel 22, David ran to a cave called Adullam. And he ran to the cave called Adullam. He was on the run from Saul. I'm just talking about caves this morning. Yeah, he ran because he was on the run from Saul. And yet the prophet sends a word to him and says, go down. Get up out of the cave and go to Judah. Woo, I can preach right there. He said, get out of the cave and go where? to Judah. If you understand that Judah means praise. Sometimes you've been sitting in the cave, but I come to declare to you, you've been in the cave long enough. You've been going through the cave experience long enough. I came as your personal prophet today to tell you to get out of the cave and go to Judah. I dare you to give God a praise. The cave Represents a place of transition. I hope somebody's getting this. The cave represents a place of transition. I go from who I was to who I'm becoming. God will use a cave, Bishop. He'll use a cave experience. To put me in transition. I thought I was going to move to Atlanta. But God moved me to Knoxville, Tennessee. To put me in a cave. But Lord have mercy. Somebody in here right now. You're in a cave position. But you need to understand that the cave is a sign to only be temporary. You want to tell yourself, I'm in transition. Transition. God, I'm in transition. Lord, have mercy. But let me close this thing now, y'all. But the cave is not only a place of transition, but the cave is also a place of recovery. God, God, you ought to go ahead and get happy because if you're in a cave right now, it's a place of recovery. There was a man by the name of Lot who Lot had got burned out of his home. He had been told, get out of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible declares that Lot decided, I'm getting up out of here. And one thing about it, when he got out of there, he did not look back. Y'all gonna help me preach this morning. He said, I will not look back. But when he came out and he got out of the place where he used to live, he landed in a cave. But the cave was his place of recovery. Tell somebody, neighbor, you're gonna be in recovery now. Yes! It's your time of recovery. It's your time of recovery. The cave is a place of recovery. Good God. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Now listen, y'all. I'm, I gotta tell y'all this, and I'm gonna get out your way. Yeah? But the number three is significant when we see it in the Bible. The number three is significant. It represents something. Can I tell y'all that there were three times in the Bible where we see life coming out of a cave? Lord have mercy. Oh, we see Elisha. Elisha was dead, and they threw a dead body in on Elisha's bones. And the Bible said that when they threw the bone of the dead man in on Elisha's bones, when they touched his bones, the dead man got up from there and came out of the cave and went to running. Good God Almighty, I'm trying to behave, y'all, but I feel the anointing. Ah, that was number one. There was another time that something good came out of a cave. Y'all remember when Lazarus was sick and Lazarus died and the Bible said they had put him in a cave. They put him in the tomb. But we thank God that life still came out of a cave. But on the third time, which is the reason why we're here and to talk about life coming out of a cave there was a man by the name of Jesus Christ who died on a cross who died on a bloody cross who died yes but they took him down and they put him in Joseph's tomb but I come to tell you that on the third day on the third day, he rose again. Something good came out of the cave. Is there anybody in this room today that knows that something good has come out of the cave? And because he got up, you can get up. Because he rose again, you're not stuck anymore. Your game experience is coming to an end. You want to tell somebody, I might be in a cave now. Oh, might be in a cave now. But wait a minute. We've been made. Endure for a night. Endure for a night. But joy, joy, joy is coming in the morning. Yes, I might be in a cave right now. But give me three days. Give me three days. Can you think of a time when you were in a cave experience but you didn't stay there? Somehow, some way, God showed up, brought you out of your cave. You ought to pray them. You ought to make them. Good. Something good. Coming out of my cave. Come out of my cave. My cave experience. Watch this. It's important that you go through the cave experience. Yes. Because watch, I'm done. But when Jesus died, if let me let me give it to you from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. If he died, shouldn't we? Be free yes. from our sins, uh -huh. whether he rose or not. Because yes. Yes. the blood mm -hmm. pays the price. Yes. Uh -huh. Shouldn't we be free uh -huh. from our sins mm -hmm. just because he died? Mm -hmm. well, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't enough mm -hmm. right. for him to die. Right. Uh -huh. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Salvation yeah. was paid in full. Yes. And the judgment of God, we had evidence that the judgment of God had been appeased. Mm -hmm. When on the third day, oh, he got up. Yeah. Got up. That's how we know that the judgment of God had been averted on man. Because uh -huh. man should have had it. Uh -huh. But he took it. Yes. And after he took it, yes. when he got up, it was proof that God had now been satisfied. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank, Thank you, God. Lord. But let me tell you what happened, and I'm done. When he got up from the grave, it was a sign to us 
that we also have victory yes. over sin yes. uh -huh. That's right. and death. And yes. Yes. Come on, man. Yes, yes. Y'all should have praised us. Yes, yes. 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 Amen. Yes. We don't have to live with excuses about our sins anymore. Mm -hmm. That's right. Talk long. Yes. We live in a society where everybody wants to make excuses uh -huh. yes. for what they've got going on in their life. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yes, yes. I mean, we can all admit we got some stuff. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Let's be real. Oh, yeah. We have some stuff. Uh -huh. But there's no reason and no right for us to make excuses oh my God. about our stuff. Right. Because <laughs> when he got up, yeah. he gave us victory yes. Mm -hmm. yes. over sin. Yes. 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 I, I hope God, yes, God, Jesus, I'm trying to behave, but I feel it right here. Somebody needs to understand that he's the habit breaker. Yeah. 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 I can hear you. I mean, he's a habit breaker. Yeah. 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 If you keep running back to lover after lover after lover to appease whatever's going on on the inside, he's a habit breaker. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. If you keep running back to alcohol, he's a Habit Keep running back to drugs, whether illegal or prescription. He's a habit breaker. Good God Almighty. If you keep living and putting yourself down in low self esteem, he's a habit breaker. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> Today in this room, Jesus, because he got up, yeah, he's a habit breaker. He's a habit breaker. Yeah. 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 You ought to declare whatever your habit is. Nobody else has to know what it is. You ought to declare my habits are being broken today. Being broken today. You might have a habit of gossiping about folk. Your habits being broken today. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He's going to cause you to realize when you're stepping over into gossip. Don't do that. Don't do it. Give me some music. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to close. I'm going to close this.